Our next speaker, John Hudak, earned his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Economics at the University of Connecticut and both his Master's and Doctorate in Political Science at Vanderbilt. He served as Program Director and Graduate, graduate Fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. John is now Deputy Director of the Center for Effective Public Management and a Senior <coughs> Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. One of his areas of expertise is bureaucratic process, a perfect qualification for his remarks tonight. John. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the invitation. I promise bureaucratic process is really boring, and I'll try to be a little bit less boring than that. I'll, I'll uh, wade through it all and offer a little bit of an overview of federal policy on the topic of uh, marijuana, medical marijuana specifically, talk a little bit about the challenges that uh, federal policy presents for a variety of individuals, groups, states, regulators, others, many people in this room, and then talk a little bit about progress, where we can find progress, where we're not seeing much progress, and where maybe down the road we will see a little more. I come at this issue as a political scientist. I'm not an advocate. I'm not an advocate in any direction. I'm not, a, uh, uh, not someone who has a secret home grow. I'm not a drug warrior. Um, I'm interested in this because it's a very interesting area of public policy, and people's lives matter in this discussion. If you're a drug warrior, you saw some of the rhetoric from before. You're afraid that it's going to lead to children being addicted, interracial sex. Whatever your worries are, you might think that lives matter. Um, if you're a patient who depends on medical marijuana for pain management, or the control of intractable epilepsy, or a variety of other ailments that you swear that you see more benefits from than you do from anticonvulsive medicines or opioids, then this is something that matters for you quite a bit as well. What I advocate for, though, is good government, is for effective and rational public policy. That's what I'm in favor of. And what we have right now with medical marijuana policy in the United States, with marijuana policy in general, is completely irrational. It is a broken system of public policy. I encourage all of you to look at some of the work we're doing at Brookings uh, on this issue. It's, it's fun, it's interesting. I have a lot of colleagues uh, joining with me to do some of this work. But one of the most interesting projects I've done so far is a nine minute video that you can find on Brookings' YouTube channel that talks with a dispensary owner in the Tacoma neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Um, and a grower uh, in Washington, D.C. who supplies the medical market. And at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the video, I say, uh, marijuana should either be illegal or it should be legal and regulated. But it shouldn't be both. But right now in the United States, it's both. And that's a problem. Under the Controlled Substances Act, as you heard before, marijuana is a Schedule I substance. It is illegal in every case in the United States. It has a high risk of abuse under this categorization. It has no medical use, and it can't be used safely in medical treatment in the United States. That's the three-pronged, that's the trifecta of prohibition in the United States for marijuana. But that's not the whole story, because you have 23 states in the District of Columbia that allow med uh, medical marijuana. You now have four states in sort of the District of Columbia that allows recreational marijuana. And most of this emerges from a series of decisions from the Obama administration that effectively say that it's easier not to be embarrassed by an inability to shut down medical marijuana or recreational marijuana operations than to try to enforce the Controlled Substances Act. Well, if you're a medical user in a medical state or a recreational user in one of the other states, that's great news. But if you're the father from Kansas whose children were taken away from them because you lived a little bit too far from a state border, that's not satisfying. And it shouldn't be satisfying for anyone who believes in effective public policy, that laws in the United States should affect Americans equally. Now, we know there's a lot of laws that don't. Marijuana is just the tip of the iceberg. But the reality is that things can be done about this. 
But things aren't being done. Instead, we have a blatantly hypocritical system surrounding this substance that can easily be fixed by proactive efforts at the legislative and the, and the executive level of our federal government. But they don't. And so what we have is a, a controlled substance, this, a Schedule One substance in marijuana that creates a circular suppression of research. Why is marijuana illegal? We heard the racialized history of it before. But from a technical and legal perspective, it's because no one has proven, supposedly, no one has proven that there's medical value to it. If you could only prove that there's medical value to it, then it doesn't fit under the categorization of Schedule 1. But in the process, by having it at Schedule 1, you suppress the ability of medical researchers across the United States to ask the important empirical question, does this have medical value? So you set up a ridiculous system that is self-enforcing. And what is it self-enforcing? It's self-enforcing prohibition. There are people in this room who have used marijuana for medical value, for sure. You're ignored by your government. There are states that have, stu that have plenty of patients who can say the same. They're ignored by their government. There is legitimate research being done by physicians across the United States and across the world that challenge that distinction, not just on medical value, but on abuse and safe use in medical treatment. All of that is ignored. And so it creates these formal barriers that reinforce the Schedule One status of cannabis, but informal barriers too. It creates norms, it creates biases, not in the law enforcement community, uh, not among Emily's parents, although that's certainly true too, uh, but within the medical community these biases exist. People are scared away from doing research. People don't want to take the chance. Is someone who has dealt with the Institutional Review Board on this campus over Nothing by comparison to cannabis research. I can't even imagine what that conversation must be like, what that review must be like with IRB. Um, those biases and those norms matter, and they matter in a way that stop science, that prevent empirical questions from being answered by qualified scientists because of a political distinction over a plant. That's unacceptable public policy. It's something that needs to be investigated, and if we find that marijuana is highly addicting and has no medical value and can't be used safely, perfect, ban it everywhere. It shouldn't be used. But if the anecdotal evidence and the observational evidence and the double-blind trials that we have about cannabis use and medical treatment are correct, then there should be a revision. So how do we revise that? So that's an interesting question, and it's something I actually uh, discussed uh, with David earlier. Uh, there is a myth out there that the president can sign an executive order and cannabis can be rescheduled. That is absolutely untrue. It is against the law. If you don't like President Obama, maybe you think he'll do it anyways. But it is, it is against the law. The letter of the law, the Controlled Substances Act, spells out a very long, very arduous, very secret process by which FDA, DEA, NIDA, the Department of Justice, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and previously the Public Health Service all work together to consider a rescheduling petition that has to be submitted to the Attorney General either by another member of the government or from an outside group. There's no time stamp on how long this must take. There is no process that can be seen by the public while it's going on. There are processes, there are uh, investigations and studies that go on behind closed doors and if the people who submit the petitions ask about timing, they're either ignored or told to wait. Rescheduling petitions in the United States have taken over 20 years to get a no. A petition that was started in the Nixon administration was finally adjudicated when George H.W. Bush was in his final years in the White House. That's a problem. That's not good government either. Government should be transparent. Government should be thoughtful and deliberative, but should not slow down processes in that manner. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable for any process. 
People are outraged about a VA backlog, and they absolutely should be, because it's bureaucratic process drawing out a, a, a government-provided uh, necessity in a way that negatively impacts people's health. It sounds pretty familiar. There's a lot of bureaucratic process that's slowed in that way. And if you, uh, uh, if you love or hate or are indifferent about marijuana, as, as our opening speaker said, that's irrelevant. You should want your government to work. Give a no when you find out you're going to give a no. Don't wait normal. Don't make normal wait for 22 years to find out. So the rescheduling petition in the executive branch is a very drawn out process. It's not so in the legislative branch. Here's how rescheduling works in the legislative branch. Congress passes a law, the president signs it, it's rescheduled, boom. Now, the how a bill becomes a law is a drawn out process, but it's much faster, much more efficient, and much more flexible, frankly, than if, if the executive branch tries to do it. And so it's hard to imagine a scenario in which marijuana will be rescheduled uh, under the Obama administration. And frankly, rescheduling marijuana is not going to solve all of the problems that exist around patient access, around testing, around the federalism issues that we face right now in the United States. It'll help a little bit, but it won't be a cure-all. But it's not to say that there isn't progress in other areas. Emily's presentation talked about a lot of states that are doing cutting edge work, not just within uh, marijuana policy, but they're doing cutting edge work in terms of making government work, in terms of good government governance, in terms of approaching a situation like this. The best example of this is Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. John Hickenlooper did not want legal marijuana in his state at all. He came out vocally opposed to it as Amendment 64 was being considered by voters in 2012. And then the voters in Colorado told them that they disagreed with him. And so the next day, his response was one that was shocking in politics, absolutely shocking in politics. He didn't come out and say, well, it's illegal so federally, so that's it. He came out and said, the voters of Colorado have spoken, and we will make this work. He'll make government work. It's shocking. I live in Washington, DC. I certainly never hear that. <laughs> Um, from, where I, from where I am, but it was interesting to hear it from Denver. You heard it um, in Olympia as well. You heard it in Salem. You heard it in Juneau. People who are committed to making this system work because they want to, and that's, that's encouraging, again, from a good governance perspective. There are a lot of reasons for why this happens, but there's a lot of progress being made toward marijuana reform, uh, and it starts with public opinion. This is something I've overlapped a little bit with the previous speakers um, uh, tonight, and I, I will a bit here again. But public opinion is a, a really interesting thing uh, around this topic. It's shifted dramatically. We now have majority support for recreational legalization in the United States. We have super majorities of support for medical uh, marijuana in the United States in every state that it's ever been polled in the past uh, eight years. That's a sea change, particularly on recreational marijuana, a sea change from where we were even 20 years ago. There are a lot of reasons for that. First, as a previous speaker noted, when people experience marijuana, they realize it's not as bad as the government has made it out to be. It's not as scary. You don't turn into a rapist or a homicidal killer. Um, you don't become any other form of maniacal lunacy that, that the 1930s era uh, drug war would suggest, but you also don't get the version that Nancy Reagan told you 30 years ago, or President Clinton told you 20 years ago, or President Bush told you 10 years ago. You don't hear any of that. You don't experience any of that. And so experience matters. People are also seeing that the sky isn't falling in medical marijuana states. People aren't dropping dead in the streets. Uh, people aren't raping and murdering a bunch of people because they have access to medical cannabis. They're seeing what happens and they're not that uncomfortable with it, at least as a, as a majority. But it's more than that. There's a, a more technical demographic and uh, political science explanation for why this is happening. And the lowest level of support in the country for marijuana legalization 
is among the voting demographic 65 and over. They're actually the only demographic in the US without majority support for um, recreational legalization. The highest levels of support come from millennials, come from the under 30 demographic, and enter the voting age electorate every year with high levels of support, 75, 80% support for uh, legalization. Well, the people who hate legalization the most, a political scientist will tell you, is exiting the electorate. They're dying. And generational replacement means the people who hate it the most are being replaced by the people who love it the most. This was true on same-sex marriage. Numbers are almost similar, actually. And it's true on marijuana legalization. So that's how you allow a sea change in public opinion to happen on an issue that seems so divisive and seems so divisive just a couple of years ago. So when you think about progress on this issue, if you're, if you're a reformer, you see public opinion is very much in your favor. If you're a drug warrior, you see this as a, a very difficult um, uh, a hill to mount. But there's progress in other areas as well. Medical research is being done in the United States. It's a little easier to do now on, on medical marijuana than it was 20 years ago when the only, uh, the only types of trials that would be approved by the federal government uh, were ones that looked at substance abuse and not uh, therapeutic treatment. Those, have, those challenges have lightened a little bit, and I stress a little bit, but you have this research being done. You have research being done in the states. You have research being done abroad. Uh, you know, there is a, um, an unnamed uh, presidential candidate who every time he gets onto the stump, he says, we're being beaten every day by other countries. They're beating us. And he's going to perhaps make America great again. But we're being beaten on the issue of medical marijuana research by a lot of other countries who are spearheading this science. And the only reason we're not doing that cutting edge science is because barriers have been erected by the federal government to prevent some of the most talented researchers at places like Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Johns Hopkins and Yale and Harvard and Stanford from doing this in a legitimate way. And when you close the door on the intellectual capacity of an institution like this one, you are harming science. And the only one to blame is the United States government. Also, as we look around, we see a difference in the advocacy community. Uh, those of you who have been advocates for quite some time remember life in the 70s or the 80s, and the community looks a little different now. It's more professionalized. There are lawyers. There are communications experts. There are social media junkies. There are people who are uh, polling on how certain messages can be targeted to certain groups. I was talking to David earlier. One of the ways in which Amendment 64 was so successful in Colorado wasn't because they ran one banner message to the people of Colorado and said, this is why you should like weed. They said, every demographic group sees this from a certain perspective. Moms see it from one perspective. It's OK if it's safe, and it's going to be out of my kids' hands. Tea partiers see it as a matter of liberty. That's, that's easy. Patients see it as a matter of access. Some people just like to smoke weed. That's a message, too, that is never discussed. But it's part of the message, and it's part of the way you target. And what makes an effective reform uh, uh, campaign is not the loudest voice in the room. It's not the person who loves the, that, that value the deepest. It's the people who are the smartest. And the people who are the smartest on marijuana reform are the people who treat this referendum not as a love of marijuana, but as any other political issue. And you build a campaign and you mount a campaign around how you message effectively, how you raise the money to run a campaign, and how at the end of the day you work within the political system that exists with tremendous barriers at the state and federal level to change, uh, to change the law. And you've seen it fail in a lot of places. Ohio's a great example of failure at its best, Ohio's effort uh, this year to, to regulate uh, marijuana. But you've seen it succeed, and you've seen it succeed in some of the oddest places. And you're going to see it succeed a little more, as was mentioned before by Paul, in more states this year. 
And so when you look forward at progress, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of reasons why uh, marijuana continues to be treated in the way that they are. Um, they're ludicrous, they're anti-scientific, they're paradoxical, and they're unfair to uh, patients across the United States who depend on, on uh, cannabis for medical treatment. But as you look ahead, a lot of that's changing, and a lot of that's changing because of conferences like this. Thanks.